One of those people meeting with government representatives today to call for a ban on handguns and assault weapons is Heidi Rathjen, coordinator of the group Poly Se Souvien, formed after the 1989 massacre at Montreal's Ecole Polytechnique. Heidi Rathjen, first of all, thanks for speaking with me today. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Tell me how the meeting went today with federal officials. Uh, give us a sense of who was in the room. Um, well, I have to say first that we only had a week's notice, so a lot of groups that would have liked to have been there, uh, including the women's shelters, public health groups, and uh, other victims groups couldn't make it, which is unfortunate. Um, but those that were there, there was uh, police representatives and uh, victims uh, or, or relatives of victims, and um, uh, the YWCA and some uh, experts in criminology. Okay, and uh, also in the room for, on behalf of the, of the Minister of, uh, Public, of uh, Borders was uh, his uh, parliamentary uh, secretary, Peter Schiefke, who was there to re represent the government, I guess. So w what is your message for the federal government as it carries out these consultations uh, for a ban on handguns and assault weapons? Well, we had a number of messages. The first one was obviously we support a ban on handguns and assault weapons, uh, especially in the case of assault weapons. This is something that we've been asking for for 29 years since the shooting at Buddy Technique, and uh, other voices have joined uh, in time, including the families of the, the victims at the Quebec mosque shooting. Um, we said that there's different ways to get to uh, getting these these types of weapons that are designed to kill people. So we're not talking about hunting rifles and shotguns, but uh, assault weapons and handguns. Um, to get them off the streets, there are different ways we can get to a ban. It uh, doesn't have to be done in one day. It could be done over generations. It could be done with a buyback program. And uh, the police suggested also with respect to handguns, if we can't get a ban, an idea would be to keep them at the gun, gun clubs. Um, Another message we had is that a very clear message from uh, most of the participants is that we expect uh, action, legislative actions within this election cycle. The Liberal government ran on a platform of gun control. They literally um, promised to get handguns and assault weapons off of our streets. Um, they have a mandate to act on this. Um, like the president of the Quebec mosque said today, uh, you know, legal gun with large capacity magazines killed uh, six people, injured seven others in a matter of two minutes. What more do we need uh, in terms of evidence of the importance and urgency of, of getting rid of these guns? Okay, let, let, can, I, can I ask you, why do you, you, you talked about the Liberal platform, why, why do you think that it's taken this long for the process to start, so late in the mandate with another election, uh, you know, less than a year away now? Do you, uh, do you hold out any hope that there can actually be some concrete action before the next election? Well, there's hope because it's possible to have another um, legislative cycle. It's possible to get it done before the next election, so we're hoping for that. Uh, we're very worried at the same time because the bill that, that was tabled by the Liberals um, in the spring uh, in response to their election promise, Bill C-71, mm -hmm. does not do anything to change the legal status of handguns and assault weapons in general. And the answer as to why, I mean, for us it's obvious, we have a very powerful gun lobby in Canada, and they are politically engaged and they can threaten, you know, to take away votes and so on. And, uh, you know, it's no secret that this has spooked a lot of uh, politicians and the government in general. And um, so, I mean, we suspect that the, you know, changing the classification of guns was not in the initial intent, intent of the government, despite their promise. But because of the terrible tragedies that occurred this summer in Toronto and in Fredericton, and the wave of public support calling for a ban on handguns and assault weapons, including um, the motions in Toronto, Quebec, and other cities, the government didn't have a choice to act. And so they launched this consultation. We hope it's genuine and they sincerely um, intend to act on this and that they're going to listen not only to the experts, but to the majority of Canadians who support these measures and not listen to, uh, or not, I would say, cave before the gun lobby, which essentially when it comes to assault weapons, for example, is a, you know, the opponents are a minority within that minority because even most gun owners support a ban on assault weapons. They serve no useful purpose. They belong in the army and not in the hands of individual Canadians. All right. For As you know, the, the, the creation 
taxes. As you know, the critics of a ban, and uh, you've referred to some of them, I guess, suggest, look, this a, a ban would do little to improve public safety, that, that criminals who want to use handguns or assault weapons will always find a way to get them. Uh, what do you say to those arguments that a ban on handguns and assault weapons will not make Canadians safer? Well, that's absolutely not true. First of all, if you look at most of the mass shootings, if not all of the mass shootings that happen in Canada, and even the United States, most of them were committed with legal guns, you know, um, by uh, legal gun owners who are, you know, not part of gangs or organized crime. They're ordinary people who, have, you know, for some reason lose it and decide to um, uh, commit these atrocities. And they have the legal means to do it because we have easy access to the type of guns that you need to shoot many people rapidly and effectively. Mm. And um, in terms of illegal guns, well, we've heard that more and more more and more uh, jurisdictions, provinces, and local police have said that um, they are seeing, because of the lax controls on legal guns, a lot of them are ending up in the hands of criminals. They get stolen um, or uh, they're, they're purchased uh, they're obtained by criminals through straw straw purchases, right. meaning somebody with a license, legal license, buys them and then sells them illegally. And that's really easy to do with uh, guns that aren't registered. And unfortunately, we have um, you know many, many models of assault weapons, semi-automatics that take large capacity magazines that have military characteristics that are currently non-restricted, which means they're not registered. There's no way okay. for police to know who owns them. Now, these guns are part of uh, part of the sources for the illegal market. So it's not true that um, there is, you know, it's super easy to get guns illegally. It depends on what's fueling the black market, how, how easy they are to cross the border, how easy it is to steal them and resell them. Okay, as, as you know, I mean, just, uh, by, you can prevent this. Yeah. These kind of as you know, Minister Blair's mandate is not to block uh, the legitimate use of firearms by Canadians. Uh, how do you interpret that statement in terms of how committed you think the government is to acting? Well, um, we don't like that language because we don't think there's any legitimate use of assault weapons, for example. There are legitimate use, like we do agree that um, there's a certain place, there's a legitimate place for hunting rifles and shotguns and maybe certain sports. But, you know, these... Um, uh, you know, these war games with assault weapons, with moving targets or targets that look like human beings, this is not the kind of thing that Canadians would support or consider legitimate. So it's a little worrisome. We're also worried by the language in the documents of the consultation that talk about limiting access as opposed to ban. It's clear that Montreal's uh, motion, Toronto's motion, and the public opinion uh, is, is thinking about banning these weapons. And uh, like I said, there's different ways we can do it. And in the okay. past, what the government did is introduce grandfather clauses, which allowed current owners of these weapons to keep them. Um, so maybe that language speaks to that kind of approach. Um, all we hope is that in the end, we will eventually get these weapons out of our communities. And how we get there, well, that's up to the government to figure out. All right, Heidi Rathjen, appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining me to talk about this. Uh, we'll continue to follow the story. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for your interest.